these countries were not able to really stand up on their own. They were, many of them were third world. And now all of a sudden they're industrialized, they're wealthy, and they know the game and they're finding safety in numbers and they are accumulating things like silver. So there are very few things on the planet, in my opinion, that offer the potential that silver does. And I, I try to poke holes in that. It has better upside potential than just about any asset on the planet. It is more undervalued than any asset on the planet. It has as many uses as any asset on the planet. And it's decreasing in nature. And it is disappearing. And the things that are used in industry, most of them are in landfills, such tiny amounts in a cell phone or in a motherboard or blown up in a bomb. Point of it is, is that this is one of those deals where, like I was saying, you know, they're going to shake you best you can from the tree. And just when you let go, that's when it'll move. But again, you don't own it to get wealthy. It is wealth, albeit might be the best investment I've ever seen in my career. Recent revelations from declassified files shed light on the strategic importance of silver in the global economy, as discussed by Andy Schechtman. These files confirm that high-tech weaponry, including Tomahawk cruise missiles, heavily rely on silver, with nearly 500 ounces in each missile tip. This underscores silver's vital role beyond mere industrial usage, positioning it as a strategic asset crucial for national defense. Moreover, countries like India have been aggressively accumulating silver, hinting at its undervaluation and immense potential. With its diverse applications diminishing supply and increasing demand, silver emerges as a compelling investment opportunity. Two years ago, I gave a speech, and I, I've been saying for a long time that, you know, there's, um, there's 500 ounces of silver in the tip of a Tomahawk cruise missile. For years, I've been saying that. And I Last year, not this last one, but the year before I gave a speech and a man came up to me and he said, you know, I work uh, as a consultant for the Department of Defense. And he says, I, I know there's some silver in there. I'm going to check on that. And I never heard back from him. I, I go and, and gave my speech again this year. And lo and behold, there he was. He had a handful of pictures. He said, everything I'm going to show you is declassified. And he showed me how they they tested the, the Tomahawk cruise missile uh, in the ocean in California on a on a automated bed about 50 feet under the water and, and how they had problems um, shooting the Tomahawk cruise missile vertically instead of horizontally because of the, the guidance system and this and that. And he says, yeah, this was my baby. And he says, I got to tell you something. You're right. There's between 14 and 15 kilograms in the tip of a Tomahawk cruise missile, almost exactly 500 ounces. You're spot on. And um, this is a guy who, who, who worked on the Tomahawk cruise missile program. Now that's just one form of, of, of munition. I mean, there's all sorts of high tech weaponry and, and missiles and, you know, and, and, and aerospace and, and, and stealth fighters. All of these things need copious amounts of silver, yet it's not talked about in the supply demand fundamentals. And I, I just, to me, when you see a country like India, Jesse, buy 400 million ounces of silver in the last two years, that's almost twice as much as is on COMEX. That's what we know of. This is not lost on a lot of the uh, the world. I believe silver should be reclassified not as a industrial metal, which certainly it is in green and and digital applications around the globe, but maybe much more than that is a strategic metal where it is needed in things like warfare. And if you look around all of a sudden we're we're currently bombing two countries, we're involved in wars all around the world. And if we're not directly involved in them, it seems as though the, the companies who ma manufacture all this stuff in the United States are supplying the wars all around the world. Now, is it too far-fetched to think, or is there is the line between conspiracy and reality not thin enough to realize that maybe there's something bigger at play here, that the people who are kind of pulling the strings around the world have made a fortune in, in creating war, and they need silver period, in order to do it. And this is why I think you're seeing, this is the one thing they did not count on, Jesse, was um, countries like India standing for delivery, draining the exchanges. And if you look at the amount of silver that's left the COMEX over the last two and a half years, it's pretty damn close to what India's accumulating. Now, it didn't all come from, from here, but my point to you is that there are a lot of countries around the world who aren't telling us the silver that they produce and accumulate. And I truly believe logarithmic decay that we will wake up one morning as the biggest, smartest money in the world, the most sophisticated, knowing the playbook, knowing where we are, who continues to accumulate these commodities 
while the Western markets, which are just ridiculous in their overt manipulation right in your face, are actually falling right into their hands. And when we created this game, these countries were not able to really stand up on their own. They were, many of them were third world. And now all of a sudden they're industrialized, they're wealthy, and they know the game, and they're finding safety in numbers, and they are accumulating things like silver. So there are very few things on the planet, in my opinion, that offer the potential that silver does. And I, I try to poke holes in that. It has better upside potential than just about any asset on the planet. It is more undervalued than any asset on the planet. It has as many uses as any asset on the planet, and it's decreasing in nature, and it is disappearing. And the things that are used in industry, most of them are in landfills, such tiny amounts in a cell phone or in a motherboard or blown up in a bomb. Point of it is, is that this is one of those deals where, like I was saying, you know, they're going to shake you best you can from the tree. And just when you let go, that's when it'll move. But again, you don't own it to get wealthy. It is wealth, albeit might be the best investment I've ever seen in my career. Continuing his analysis, Andy Schechtman delves into the intricate workings of the COMEX market, revealing its role in offsetting risk through paper contracts. He highlights the staggering leverage available, where a $7,000 margin controls $100 gold contracts, providing a glimpse into the mechanics behind market manipulation. Schechtman underscores the massive drainage of physical silver and gold from exchanges like COMEX and the strategic moves by entities like China to assert dominance in global commodity markets. With central banks and sovereign wealth funds leveraging paper contracts to influence prices, Schechtman emphasizes the critical importance of understanding these dynamics for investors. The COMEX market was designed to offset risk. Um, and like, for example, if I have 5,000 ounces of gold in my warehouse, I want to offset that risk by selling 5,000 ounces of gold on paper on COMEX so that if one goes up, the other goes down commensurate. I'm market neutral uh, to the swings in the price of gold. If I have 5,000 ounces and the price drops 100 bucks, I'm out a half a million dollars. That's not good. But I would be up on the exact same amount on what I sold short on COMEX. That is a, that is a covered position and is done to offset risk. It's a hedge. But... I asked my head trader, you know, several months ago, what did it cost to, to control a 100 ounce gold contract? And he said, uh, roughly $7,000 in our margin account. The trade is just a couple of bucks. So if I'm a commercial or a central bank with that, that's basically 35 times leverage or thereabouts. So if I have 500 million in my margin account as a commercial or a central bank or a sovereign wealth fund, I in, in essence control 15 plus billion. In, in contracts. And when you take a look at how, you know, after the CPI, the CPI numbers or, or the unemployment numbers rather came out the other day, bang, they smacked the crap out of it. Well, that's exactly what they do. They, they sell short contracts and they, they overload the market with, uh, you know, with paper. And when the price is, is falling on paper, you see massive, massive uh, deliveries coming off of all of the exchanges. They're draining the exchanges um, in the last, as an example, um, in the last two years, we've seen five and a half million ounces of, um, well, let me take that back. 350 million ounces came off of COMEX in the last two and a half years. Five and a half million ounces of silver were delivered out of COMEX this week. Uh, 40 million ounces of gold taken off of COMEX in the last three years. 877,000 ounces last week. That's the largest I can remember. So what you're basically seeing, huge amounts of what's called exchange for physical, where contracts are issued in, in, on COMEX and delivered in London, the Shanghai Gold Exchange being bled dry. What you are seeing is using the paper price and the levered paper price um, to, in essence, drain all of the exchanges. And then now you see Shanghai have list higher prices for um, – for gold and silver on Shanghai exchange, where gold is 80 hundred bucks higher um, than London or uh, or on COMEX and silver is as much as two and a half bucks higher. So they're incentivizing the traders to take to make purchases in London and make purchases on COMEX and deliver it to 
Shanghai. And I wonder how many people even know the fact that the Shanghai Gold, uh, excuse me, that the, the London Metals Exchange, the LBMA, was purchased by the Chinese a few years ago. They own it. And now you have the Chinese saying, but by the way, we want to start trading Shanghai contracts on the LBMA where the price is higher. And by the way, we also want to start warehousing the metals traded on the LBMA in Hong Kong. So think about this for a minute. Do you see a problem here? Do you see how things are slowly, slowly being bled dry out of the West? And now what they're doing is they're arbitraging. They're, they're warehousing the metals that on the exchange that they own. No one knows that. It's not called the Chinese Bullion Market Association. It's the London, but they bought it. They own it. So they're draining the exchanges, both the COMEX and the LBMA. They own the LBMA. They're listing Shanghai contracts on the LBMA or will be soon. And now they want to warehouse metals traded on the LBMA in China, the largest importer and producer of gold in the world. They've bought for 14 straight months in a row. This is a game of, of chess while we think of checkers and they are positioning themselves to, in essence, own all of the things that make the world go round, not just gold and silver, but anything, base metals, uh, rare earth metals, and hard and soft commodities across the board. So they, they are thinking much more strategically than we are, and we're focused on the wrong things. You know, Rick Rule said it best. He said something to the extent that when you go through many, many years of, of a structural supply deficit in silver, and at the same time, the speculators who bought it thinking that they, a lot of them thought they'd get rich. And, and I never sell metal to get wealthy. It is wealth and probably will end up making you wealthy. If you have strong enough fingertips. But these people are getting more and more frustrated. Many are capitulating, as you say. And, and that, that big rise everyone expects that attracted them in the first place to me in that contrarian environment seems to be getting, getting imminently closer because of that. Because when everyone finally lets go and says, I'm done, I can't take this anymore, that's when we see the rise. But when you talk about an asymmetrical risk-reward type of environment, what can I invest in that has the lowest downside risk and the best upside? I don't see a better thing in the world than silver, Jesse. And I, I try to be objective. I mean, if you're, if you're um, not objective, you're full of crap and people will, will bust right through it. I think to myself, I mean... You know, you look at the at the Silver Institute, who's telling us the supply demand fundamentals, and they ignore the military industrial complex. They don't even put that in there. In today's discussion, we've uncovered some eye opening insights into the strategic importance of silver from its integral role in high tech weaponry to its implications in global financial markets. Andy Sheckman's revelations shed light on the intricate workings of commodity exchanges like COMEX and the geopolitical maneuvers influencing precious metal prices. As we navigate through these complex dynamics, it's crucial to stay informed and vigilant about the forces shaping our economic landscape. We hope you found today's episode enlightening. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more thought-provoking discussions, like this video, and share your thoughts in the comments section below. Your feedback is invaluable as we continue to explore the fascinating world of finance. Thanks for watching.